China's one country, two systems model of rule in Hong Kong has worked in protecting the city and must continue long term. That's according to China's President Xi Jinping. The Chinese leader has mounted a stern defense of the political system in a speech in Hong Kong following recent international criticism. Hong Kong is marking 25 years since Britain returned the city to China. It's under tight security as it hosts uh, President Xi, who is on his first trip outside the mainland in two years. Hong Kong marks the 25th anniversary of its handover from British to Chinese rule with a flag-raising ceremony attended by its new sworn-in chief executive, John Lee. The anniversary traditionally sees thousands march to protest Beijing's grip over the city, but not this time. The most outspoken opposition politicians and democracy activists are either in jail or in self-exile. I think in my mind that, uh, and I think for many in Hong Kong, this is a city that is no longer recognizable. Uh, even five years ago, you uh, would expect that uh, July 1st marks actually a day of protest. Amid tight security, China's President Xi Jinping makes a rare visit to the global financial hub for the occasion. In a speech, Mr. Xi defends the one country, two systems model as having worked in protecting Hong Kong's prosperity and stability as well as China's fundamental interests in the past 25 years. Back in 1997, Beijing promised wide-ranging autonomy, unfettered individual rights and judicial independence at least until 2047. But China's critics accuse authorities of trampling on those freedoms unavailable on the authoritarian mainland with a sweeping national security law imposed by Beijing on Hong Kong in 2020 after mass pro-democracy protests the year before. I think as an outsider to understand what's going on in Hong Kong, just imagine uh, a similar hardline crackdown in New York or London. I mean, basically Hong Kong was one of the freest, uh, most open societies in Asia, even ranked as such for years. Uh, and so that's where the crackdown is occurring. So almost all the ingredients of an open society are under threat. The universities, the secondary schools, uh, you know, the broadcast media and so on. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says China has failed to meet its handover commitments. But on the 25th anniversary of the handover, we simply cannot avoid the fact that for some time now, Beijing has been failing to comply with its obligations. It's a state of affairs that threatens both the rights and freedoms of Hong Kongers and the continued progress and prosperity of their home. But we are not giving up on Hong Kong. 25 years ago, we made a promise to the territory and its people, and we intend to keep it. Doing all we can to hold China to its commitments so that Hong Kong is once again run by the people of Hong Kong for the people of Hong Kong. China and Hong Kong reject the accusations, saying the law restored order from chaos. Lee, a former police officer sanctioned by Washington over his role in implementing the security law, now takes charge. The city is facing an exodus of people and talent amid some of the toughest health crisis restrictions in the world. And over to the United States, a number of immigrant activists have held a vigil along the U.S.-Mexico border to honor the victims of the migrant truck tragedy and the hundreds of migrants who died while trying to reach the United States. Holding up banners that read, stop the immigration policies that kill migrants, advocates blamed the migrant deaths on hardline immigration policies. The U.S. Supreme Court on Thursday gave a major boost to President Joe Biden's drive to end a hardline immigration policy begun under his predecessor, Donald Trump, that forced tens of thousands of migrants 
migrants to stay in Mexico to await U.S. hearings on their asylum claims. The justices in a 5-4 to four ruling authored by Chief Justice John Roberts overturned a lower court's decision requiring Biden to restart Trump's Remain in Mexico policy after the Republican-led state of Texas and Missouri sued to maintain the program. That's a small win. We are grateful, but still, that's only that not even the tip of the iceberg. Like, there's so much more that needs to be done, and Biden and the Democrats and Congress need to take action. Esperar que, ojalá que ya eh, con todo esto que está sucediendo, que fue desafortunado, pero que que realmente tomen conciencia go los gobiernos para que cambien estas leyes. Our Washington correspondent Maria Bird joins us now for more on the program. Maria, firstly, uh, bring us up to speed on the investigation regarding the death of the migrants uh, found abandoned in a truck earlier this week. Yes, uh, Janela, thank you for that. It is clear that the investigation is underway and that we are seeing that there are now two individuals that are being investigated and that have been brought before the court. Uh, we know that one gentleman was about the age of 42 um, and that he was the one that was actually uh, driving that tractor trailer where the migrants were found dead. And he was actually hiding within the bushes um, near the trailer. Uh, and that was where he ended up uh, being found by authorities. Um, and that's when they then were able to locate the vehicle. And so he is looking at charges of life imprisonment um, or even potentially the death penalty and some uh, fines that could be fall up to $250,000. Now it's also been said that he had someone that was conspiring potentially with him that was text messaging him uh, that knew of what was happening and was waiting on him for the next drop. Uh, these individuals were found at what they're believing was a stash house right near the U.S.-Mexico border. You know, the, the governor of Texas this week has used the opportunity or this tragedy to call uh, for the Trump border war. What's the general opinion in the country? Do people want the war? Yes, you know, the general opinion in the country is that this is something that must be addressed um, urgently. Uh, we know that, that, that when you talk about humanity, you talk about lives that are being lost. This is the largest number of lives lost as a, as a result of migrants trying to um, enter the U.S., 53 uh, to be exact. And so that is something I think is concerning many Americans and, and like even the Republican Party, but their concerns are a bit different. Um, it's about the, uh, they, they see this as a threat, um, as violence, as uh, they believe that there's going to be additional um, incidents um, as a result of what they believe is a, uh, is not protecting the border and what they believe is uh, pretty chaotic right there at the border due to a lack of controls and policies in place to address this as a, as a whole. So how exactly is the Biden administration aiming to curb illegal immigration into the country in the wake of the recent deaths? Now, what the Biden administration is looking to do is they're looking to put more uh, officers at the border. They're also looking for ways that they can perform ISIS. Um, uh, they're obviously looking at being able to, most importantly, we know that President Biden has worked very hard with uh, building international relations. So looking at Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Mexico's presidents to come up with some sort of a plan uh, that will address uh, this humanitarian crisis. And what does this uh, latest ruling against the uh, stay in Mexico policy, what does that mean uh, for President Biden's policies to pursue what he calls a more humane approach at the southern border, even as Republicans blame him for what they view as an immigration crisis? Well, you know, the Title 42 is what was been put in place uh, by former President Trump, um, which is believed to not have a very humanitarian approach. We know that individuals are obviously trying to enter the U.S. at very uh, record numbers. We were expecting this after COVID, and, and with many are blaming this on the new administration, this was anticipated to happen even during the Trump administration as COVID became a greater threat to the globe and to the world. And as the U.S. began to manage uh, COVID in, in, a, in a better way. And obviously, this has also impacted the economic structures of many bordering countries of the U.S. So this was anticipated that it would occur. Um, and so the policies that he's looking at being able to put in place will also address some of the detention centers, uh, which are in, in situations where people are not always being given the best care. 
um, being able to keep families together. So he's really going to look at a protocol uh, that will enable um, humane uh, processing of individuals and to expedite the processing and to take some of the moratoriums off of uh, many of the immigration processing that exists today. All right, then, Maria, thank you so much for bringing us up to speed. Thank you. Solar stories now. 46 countries have successfully eliminated at least one neglected tropical disease and 761 million people have received treatment for NTDS. The World Health Organization validated Rwanda, Uganda and Benin for having eliminated sleeping sickness as a public health problem. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia and Togo have managed to eliminate the coma as a public health problem. Problem. Though there have been these uh, success stories, NTDS continue to plague over a billion people across the world, especially in remote areas where access to medical treatment is a challenge and information is limited. The Kigali Summit on Malaria and Neglected Tropical Diseases was recently held in Rwanda to address and tackle challenges faced by people affected and to find tangible solutions by both governments and private organizations. Our South Africa correspondent, Brian Pugeni, reports. Neglected tropical diseases are a group of 20 tropical diseases found in several countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America where people do not have access to clean water or safe ways to dispose of human waste, and these include dengue fever, trachoma, rabies, and leprosy, amongst others. People living with these diseases face many social and emotional challenges. I have suffered both malaria and elephantiasis. My problem started in 2014, 1st of May, when my, go, my leg got swollen. I got fever, muscle ache, and piercing in my bones. I went to the local clinic, but only got painkillers. Pain there was no medication for my condition. After four years living in pain, my wife ran away living three children with me. The reason was because I was not able to work for the family. We do not have a will or the resources to treat people like me. We cannot, we cannot allow so many billions of people in the world to continue to suffer from preventable and treated disease. Tawanda's story is one of many stories across Africa, and the Kigali Summit on Malaria and Neglected Tropical Diseases sought ways to address these challenges not just through funding, but also innovative ways of increasing awareness and improving access to treatment. Uh, GSK and Pfizer, Pfizer extending their donation of azithromycin to 2030. This is an incredible donation from a partner pharmaceutical company donating this medicine to prevent blindness from um, trachoma. NGSK committing over a billion pounds in R&D for malaria and neglected tropical diseases. Those investments require countries to step in and bring in the domestic resources that are needed to fully maximize the contributions of industry partners and all of the other partners that are coming around the table. Dr. Tijani Salami is the principal medical officer at the Federal University of Technology, MENA, in Nigeria. He says faces behind the NTD statistics can and should be helped. Just like the sources that we recorded in uh, HIV and tuberculosis, by assessing those people, going to their homes, search for them. So we, we need that in uh, NTD. We need to meet these people in the rural area, search for them, look for them, and then care for them. If we are to reduce the burden of people requiring an intervention against an NTD, we have 1.7 billion people right now that need an intervention against an NTD. We need to reduce that number to 200 million by 2030. So I want everybody to go away thinking we have an urgent job to do. The Kigali Summit have emphasized the need for innovative tools and strategies to tackle malaria and NTDs. Over a billion U.S. dollars was pledged in this ongoing fight with the goal of zero by 30, meaning zero cases by 2030 being the target. From Kigali, Rwanda, Brian Pugeni, Channel Television News.
And in Malawi, in the wake of inflation and recent evaluation of the kwacha amid rising commodity prices, Malawians are facing high food prices with thousands battling to put food on the table. Rachel Vuyiyi, who sells sweet potatoes by the roadside, is one of many feeling the pinch. She's worried that she may not be able to feed her six children in the coming weeks. In the wake of inflation and recent devaluation of the kwacha, blamed on rising commodity prices, Malawians are facing high food prices, with thousands battling to put food on the table. Rachel Vuyiyi, who sells potatoes on the side of the road, is one of many feeling the brunt of high food costs. Vuyiyi says she's worried she will not be able to feed her six children, who are all still in school. Honestly, maize was the cheapest in the recent past. I could buy the whole bag. I was able to even buy processed flour from shops, but no more. Just yesterday, I sent my son to buy five kilograms. He came back because the prices have gone up, so I opted to just buy enough for supper. Even at a government market, the price is high to a point that I cannot afford. The government must surely intervene. The 41-year-old who mainly buys staple foods like maize and potatoes said she and her family are now surviving on one meal a day. We are now used to skipping meals. Like this lunch hour, we have not eaten. I'm cooking sweet potatoes here, and this is to be served for dinner. We are eight in my family, and life is not easy. Previously, we could afford three meals a day. This is not the case now. We cannot eat all the three meals because a bag lasts only for a week. The country's year-on-year -year inflation rose to 19.1% in May from 15.7% in April, according to the National Statistical Office. Fuel also hiked by an average of 35% to cover the rising cost of imports, the Malawi Energy Regulatory Authority has said last week. A maize shop owner said he's also feeling the pinch as his sales have taken a significant dip over the past few months. Elliot Chepa says a variety of factors are causing the high maize prices, including climate change affecting crops. As it stands, Malawi should brace for tough times. Maize did better in the central region. There is no maize in the southern region. As such, everyone is scrambling for it. So the prices are high, but they go higher. The prices could go as high as 20 to 25 dollars per 50 kilogram bag by the end of the year. Protest groups calling themselves concerned citizens have massed in cities in recent months demanding the resignation of President Lazarus Chakwera, whom they accuse of mismanaging the economy and failing to shield the poorest from inflation. The United Nations says its investigators have started a probe into the recent mass killings of ethnic minorities in Western Ethiopia. There had been calls for independent investigations, and now the Commission of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia, appointed by the UN, has said it's doing exactly that. It's also examining allegations of abuses in the brutal civil war in the north. There's been a lull in fighting in northern Ethiopia, while conflict continues to spread in other areas. The Commission says the ongoing spread of violence in the country is an early warning indicator of further atrocities. Ethiopia was initially opposed to the Commission's establishment in December to look into accusations of atrocities in the north, but now its members are allowed to enter the country. The Commission is alarmed that violations and abuses of international human rights, humanitarian and refugee law, the subject matter of our inquiry, appear still to be perpetrated with impunity even now by various parties to the conflict. This spread of violence, the dire humanitarian crisis made worse by lack of access in some areas by the civilian population to humanitarian assistance, including medical and food aid, obstruction of aid workers and persistent drought exacerbates the suffering of millions of people in Ethiopia and in the region. The Commission emphasizes 
the responsibility of the government of Ethiopia to bring to an end such violations on its territory and bring those responsible to justice. The country is now turning a page. The government of Ethiopia has decided to seek peaceful end to the conflict. An inclusive national dialogue is launched to address political problems across the country. The government has taken numerous confidence building measures. At least 14 people have been killed after a massive landslide in a remote area of the northeastern Indian state of Manipur. Drone footage shows the scale of devastation after the landslide hit a railway construction site where workers were sleeping in a makeshift camp overnight. Rescue workers pulled out 19 survivors from the rubble. Officials say another 60 people, including villagers, laborers and army personnel, are still buried and trapped. The massive accumulation of debris has blocked the Ije River, creating a reservoir that may inundate uh, low-lying areas. We have uh, brought out 23 people from the debris. Out of this, uh, 14 people are dead and more uh, are being searched for as of now. And uh, because it has not rained since morning, uh, the heavy machinery has arrived and work has also started. More bodies are also expected. It is not exactly known um, how many people are buried, but as of now, uh, we are told that there are still six zero sixty people including the villagers as well as the army people and uh, the railway people laborers and all a landslide in the northern turkish city of artvin has killed at least one person and injured two others according to local reports the rocks dragged by a landslide fell on four semi-trucks which had been queuing on the highway Two of the vehicles were completely buried under the rubble, whilst two others were heavily damaged. Footage from the Hopper search and rescue team showed the teams working to recover the body of a deceased driver, which was trapped under the rubble. A large number of rescue teams were dispatched to the scene following the disaster, and the road was closed to traffic. The World Health Organization says sustained transmission of monkeypox worldwide could see the virus begin to move into high-risk groups such as pregnant women, immunocompromised people and children. WHO said it's investigating reports of infected children, including two cases in Britain, as well as following up reports in Spain and France. None of the cases in children have been severe. The virus has now been identified in more than 50 new countries outside the countries in Africa where it's endemic. Cases are also rising in those countries calling for testing to be ramped up. The virus has now been identified in more than 50 new countries and that trend is likely to continue. I'm concerned about sustained transmission because it would suggest that the virus is establishing itself and it could move into high-risk groups, including children, the immunocompromised and pregnant women. We're starting to see this with several children already infected. While the emergency committee did not advise that the current outbreak represents a public health emergency of international concern, they acknowledge the emergency nature of the event and that controlling the further spread requires intense response efforts. They also advised that I should reconvene them quickly based on the evolving situation, which I will do. So far, there have been a number of cases reported, particularly countries with good surveillance. We are aware about two cases in UK and we are following up with uh, Spain and France. And when we say children, children are less than age of 18. Some of them may be male of 17, 18, will share. So as of now, we don't have any severe cases, but it's an age group that we are really concerned about. It still was something that required 
further data collection, intense response, engagement with communities, development of countermeasures, uh, and actually specifically, I believe, uh, asked you, Secretary Tedros, through the report to reconvene them as soon as possible as further data emerge. So I think the calling of the committee itself was a very significant uh, uh, event. The committee's report clearly indicates the areas in which we need to intensify the response. And over in Japan, thousands of visitors have flocked to a water park which opened earlier than usual for the summer season as a heat wave grips the Japanese capital for a seventh consecutive day. Temperatures rose above 35 degrees Celsius as large crowds of people splashed in the pools at Yumuri Land Amusement Park. Summer in Japan is hot for the heat started earlier than usual this year, with temperatures in June the highest for the month since record keeping began 147 years ago. Tokyo's offices went dark on Thursday to conserve electricity in order to avert a looming power cut under the strain of the city's hottest June. Staff at Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry switched off lights partially in their office to save power and four of ten elevators were shut down in the afternoon when the reserve of power generation capacity for the Tokyo area was running low. And our New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has met with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson on her first visit to the country since the coronavirus pandemic. Johnson and Ardern sat down for talks at 10 Downing Street, during which the leaders said they would discuss the ratification of a free trade agreement between their countries, which was signed in February but has yet to come into force. Arden also said she wanted to use her visit uh, to invite tourists to New Zealand. The country has kept its borders closed to non-citizens throughout the pandemic, but is set to welcome back visitors and reopen fully by the end of July. Now, a UK startup hopes its lightweight hybrid uh, can bring the gap between cars and bikes and make the electric motoring more affordable. Northern Light Motors claims its vehicles are extremely energy efficient and a fraction of the cost of a regular electric vehicle. Their three models start with the pedal-powered 48, priced from uh, £4,000. Full production starts this summer, and the first batch is expected to be delivered early next year. Oh, so my, my background's in car design, um, working for major OE, OEMs, uh, and I've been getting increasingly frustrated with the complexity of the vehicles, with the legislation that we've got to get, comply with. So. I think a simple vehicle that's got the key ingredients, i.e. weather protection, some safety, some luggage, uh, is the way forward. It is all about building that, that, that gap between, um, bridging the gap between bike and car. Um, I think the key, the key elements to that are, like I said, the luggage requirement, the safety element, and the aerodynamics as well. So you get a massive benefit by having an enclosed body, with, which is low drag, you get much more efficiency out of that as well. Uh, all of the contactable surfaces are well above bumper height, which is an, another important consideration. It's got massive crumple zones, especially at the rear, with the wheels, for example, and then it's got bulkheads, internal bulkheads, which are set back from the front and inboard from the rear, so there's extra safety there as well, and there's, there's core materials in the composites as well. So it's much safer than driving a, an e-bike or, or a moped, and somewhere between a moped and, and a car in that regard. And finally on the program, a small town Mexican mayor has married his alligator bride in a colorful ceremony. As traditional music rang out and ravelers danced while imploring the indigenous leader to seal the mutuals with a kiss. San Pedro Mayor Victor Hugo Sosa obliged more than once during the wedding, bending down to plant his lips on the small alligator snout, which had been tied shut, presumably to avoid unwanted biting. The ritual marriage likely dates back centuries to pre Hispanic times among Tonto and Ave indigenous communities, like a prayer pleading for nature's bounty. The age old ritual, now mixed with Catholic spirituality, involved dress and the alligator in a white wedding dress plus other colorful garments.
that's some weirdness to kick off your weekend. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenny Olash, Shabuale.